Should you buy social media followers and likes? And how to profit from the spoils of streaming? This is episode 66 of Media Unplugged. What is, isn't that the Demons episode 66? No, 666. Oh, it, sorry. It, it. <laughs> <laughs> the podcast <laughs> that goes behind the spin to reveal what's really happening in media. Media Unplugged <laughs> with Tom A. Sacker and Mark Ramsey. <laughs> We won't be around for that one, so don't worry about it. (laughs) Welcome to Media Unplugged. I'm Mark Ramsey. And I'm Tom Asacker. This episode of Media Unplugged is brought to you by Stack Adapt. Stack Adapt is an omnichannel digital advertising platform that helps brands accelerate customer acquisition. If you are an agency or a brand, the biggest challenge you have is capturing attention. We're going to be talking about that a lot on this oh, episode, yeah. in fact. Stack Adapt helps you find audiences that are reading about relevant topics or competing products before they search for them. It's like radar. That means you reach potential customers faster and more efficiently. It's simple technology that works. Who could ask for anything more? Visit stackadapt.com and request an invite today. So, Tom, should you buy social media followers and likes? You know, we assume the answer to that question is no, right? It's not what the author says, right? That's not what the author <laughs> says. It's really interesting. This is from Social Media Today. And I never thought I'd hear a case that argued yes, but here's that case. Here's how he begins the article. Back in April, Instagram reported that it now has more than 700 million monthly active users and that it's growing faster than ever. But many of the surrounding comments on the back of this noted that many of the profiles on Instagram are bots artificially inflating people's followers and like counts for a fee in order to boost their reputation and, in the case of, quote, influencers, we've talked about them before, yes. earn them money. So I thought that was so interesting. And, in fact, he has a tweet in there that said, there apparently there are vending machines in Russia that sell Instagram likes and followers. <laughs> Which I just love. So yeah, you go to a funny. machine in Russia and put money into it to buy something that doesn't really exist. <laughs> Isn't that great? That's what the world has come to. That's what we're coming to. <laughs> and here's the thing, he says, for some people, buying likes and followers actually makes some sense. And here's the illustration that he uh, uses, which really does make sense. A friend of his asked how she could grow her Instagram following and whether she should consider buying fake followers. He said definitely not because they won't engage, they won't interact. And they're easy to spot, relatively speaking. But her case was different. The friend is an aspiring model. And she said that many agencies won't even give her a look unless she has 15,000 followers on Instagram. Now, this is interesting, Tom, because I would be willing to bet that you as a published author Mm. would probably have an easier conversation with a potential publisher if you wanted to go that route if you had numbers social media numbers, which dazzled them. Is that accurate? <laughs> yeah. So it's a catch-22, isn't it? It, it, it? In order to get someone to pay attention to you, you have to appear that you're worth paying attention to in the first place. Right. Right? And unfortunately, that's the reality in a marketplace of abundance. And online, what do we do? We, we get followers, we get likes, we get reviews, because we're all fighting the same battle, this battle for attention. Mm-hmm. Now, <laughs> it's interesting because you typically, when, and you just, you know, you brought it up, you said, okay, as an author, to get the attention of like big time publishers, mm-hmm. wouldn't it be great to have millions of followers? Yeah, you know, what's interesting about that is that they don't even ask whether these millions of followers engage with you and actually do what you tweet out or what you put on Facebook. They just want to know that you have millions of followers. Right. And they, they make literally the assumption. only want the number. Yeah. Right. And then they make the assumption, oh, they must be engaged people. Otherwise, why are they following you? Right. That is, that's the, the issue with this whole thing. It's not just buying these things. It's that the mm-hmm. people that are following you are not engaged with you most of the time. It's mm-hmm. you follow me, I follow you. Mm-hmm. And no one knows what anyone does. Yeah, it's it's so interesting because you would assume that there would be some sense of, well, you know, the superficial answer is not deep enough. I need a truer answer. I need some kind of accounting. I need some kind of, you know, 
some some <laughs> something some evidence right evidence but the evidence is right in front of their eyes and that's as far as they take it he say he uses an example if you go to a facebook page that has 132 likes you're going to judge it especially if a competing page has 5000 likes and while it's entirely possible to do some investigative work and establish whether a page may have purchased their following most regular people either won't know or won't bother and by the way i don't think it is that easy and, and in fact, over the years, I can tell you with regard to Facebook, they've actually made it more difficult. You used to be able to say, you used to be able to type in, show me the countries where people are following page X and you could get an answer mm -hmm. and you would see, you would see Tunisia, you would see, you know, Pakistan. Now you, a lot of those questions do not work. Right. Um, I had a case some years ago and I was able to, to vet this. Where I got a call from someone, and he had uh, he was associated, I guess, with a smallish country station in a smallish southeastern American market, and he said, "Look at all the social. We have more social media followers and following here than any other country, than country radio stations that are ten times our size." And I looked at it, and indeed, the numbers were impressive. And then I went and I asked some questions in Facebook about what countries and who their most, you know, their, their, the followers were. And you would right. see names that were foreign and you would see Pakistan. I would think, you know, it's <laughs> not only is it surprising that they have as many followers as they do. It's as surprising that the station is as popular as it is in Pakistan as it is. <laughs> and you know that you could do, but it's increasingly difficult to do that nowadays. And, uh, as a result, I think it's so much easier not to. Because they don't listen. His statement, when he wrote that the only true way to measure influence is to conduct your own research into their engagement rates and interaction. Good luck. But again, as noted, he wrote most people won't. Mm -hmm. Here's the interesting part of that. So if a human can describe how to conduct that kind of research, then a computer can conduct it for you. Of course. Okay. So why isn't that out there now? Well, he goes on to say that occasionally, you know, that you risk, of course, having your account banned. But he said generally that doesn't happen. All they do is flush the fakes. Right. Because, look, these, you know, there's a mutual dependency thing going on here, right? Exactly. That's Facebook, what's going on. They don't Facebook, want to pull the curtain back on they any don't, of this. They don't want you to go away. They want the fakes to go the way. By the way, fakes may hurt uh, the, the, the truth of social interaction. But the more fakes you have, if you think they're real the more proud you are and the better it is for the platform which hosts the fakes. So it becomes this, uh, you know, oddly virtuous uh, uh, cycle where uh, more fakes mean more credit, even as there are more fakes, which means less interaction. Um, it's just utterly bizarre, but you can actually see the logic for it here. <laughs> of course, he says the wider issue is that it devalues social media overall, in case anyone really cares about the truth of what goes on in social media, <laughs> rather than the symbols associated with counts. Right. People who might be skeptical of the benefits and impact of social have these doubts confirmed every time there's a new report of fake account levels, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. When you check your analytics on any social platform, you can access insights or varying capacity on this front, but... If all your followers are fake, the data is useless. That assumes the data is useful for using the data rather than acting as a symbol, as a symbol of status. If you're using it the way you use, you know, the label on your car, <laughs> then it doesn't need to be a good car. It just needs to be a good label. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But look, let me ask you this, because um, I thought a lot about this, this bot thing. Mm -hmm. So if a bot... Let, let, so let's say that there's an Instagram account uh, and it's a bot that's going out and I don't know how they do it, right? Getting these pictures and posting them and redirecting people to different pictures, whatever, photos. If that bot captures people's attention and then it redirects some of that attention to you for a small fee, and let's say that that attention is more than you can achieve on your own or for a, you know, a substantially reduced amount of money. So what's the problem with that? There's, there's nothing. Then there's nothing fake about that, is there? No, no. Who's Except faking that who? it's not. Well, <laughs> it, it become. I, I get what you're trying to say, and you're absolutely right. Because, and, but this is where fake news comes from, right? It moves attention. That doesn't make the the facts true. That makes the attention real, right? So these <laughs> exactly. things move real attention right. so that makes them th this is why people have an issue with it in the first place not because it's bad but because it's so good 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, look, it's a big game. It's a big game. Look, so I have, think of it this way. I have, I don't know, 4,500 some odd Twitter followers, right? That's not a big number. But those people's combined followers mm-hmm. total in the tens of millions. If I took those 4,500 and I added up their number of followers, it's millions of people. Mm-hmm. So if my followers would tweet out about my new novel, it, it, would, it would be huge. <laughs> But they don't do it. I'd rather have a bunch of bots following me <laughs> who automatically tweet out to people. Do, do, By the do you way, know what I'm saying? Unless I do. Unless it's bots all the way down, and then there's nobody going to buy the book that, anyway. That's correct. That's <laughs> correct. By the way, the, 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 the book is I Am Keats, <laughs> and uh, it's the novelized version of uh, the previous version of the book, and everyone should get it. And I have a copy on the top of my desk right now. And just so you know, Tom, I haven't tweeted about it because I'm in the process of no, reading it. Okay? I know that, Mark. I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about all those other followers. No, but you're exactly, <laughs> you're exactly right. I'll, I mean, if attention is the, uh, the, if attention is um, uh, the coin of the realm, right. then anything which generates or moves it for you has value and whether that is uh, real people or fake people doesn't matter. I mean, does it, does it matter if people see or don't see my television commercial, if it works? Right. Listen, and all of this, this, most of these ads online are all done by robots. <laughs> How come nobody's yelling at that? Oh, I don't want a robot doing the, you know, this product placement ad. <laughs> Why not? That's what all your social media people are doing anyway. It's just a big game everybody's playing, a big marketing and attention it is. game. I mean, I am so sick of uh, clicking on those tabula things <laughs> where it says, you know, you won't believe what uh, what so-and-so looks like now. Oh, and yeah. each, and they've got 25 of them. And you click through, you got to click through each and every one. Oh, and every they page make sure has to reload too. Every page has to reload with new spots, with new commercial, with new ads every time, and they make sure the one you're looking for is the last of the 25. I don't think I've ever gotten to the end. Why don't just you for the and record, I just just sell like a, a photo book, what they look like now, just to stop all of that stuff. You just sit and you sit at your table and you look at what they look like now. Are you talking about an actual book? Well, that's true. People don't read books anymore. <laughs> Damn. You're listening to Media Unplugged with Tom Masacker and Mark Ramsey. Uh, How to Profit from the Spoils of Streaming. This is from a piece in Forbes, and it's about the artist The Weeknd. Well, actually, he's in the title anyway, The Artist The Weeknd. The Weeknd's $92 million year and the new streaming economy behind it. I think this is stuff we've... Yeah, you know, we've talked about a lot of this before. It's not essentially new, but yeah, it's, but the it was, numbers kind of put a uh, punctuation mark on it, don't they? Well, they do for a couple of reasons. Remember, one of our first episodes was the Taylor Swift thing when right. she, you know, divorced uh, Spotify in favor of Apple Music. Oh, by the way, she's back now. Hush, hush. Not making a big fuss over it, but she's back. I thought we so, said something like that. <laughs> I think we absolutely did. So I don't know what happened to her principles, but it seems to me the math underlying her argument has not changed, and yet her behavior's changed. So you tell me whether we were right or not. So the article says streaming is now the dominant platform for music consumption. It's growing rapidly, up 76% year over year, according to Nielsen, which is amazing. YouTube has birthed a whole new brand of celebrity, the YouTube star, and Netflix uh, plans to spend, spend hundreds of millions annually on original content. You don't really have to own anything anymore because for $10 a month, you can have everything. That's pretty, well, that's a pretty, that's the statement of the article right there. That's the, that's the main <laughs> statement of the, I find that not to be quite true, but that in, with regard to music, it may be true, but not with regard to, to movies, movies and so on. Right. For musicians, the going rate of a little less than a penny per on-demand stream may not sound like a lot, but it adds up for the 14 performers on our list who topped 1 billion spins over the past year. Comedians with devoted fan bases, Adam Sandler, Chris Rock, have been extracting eight-figure checks from Netflix, and stars turned impresarios like Ellen DeGeneres and Dwayne Johnson now have video streaming ventures they can call their own, just as Dr. Dre did with Beats Music and Jay-Z is doing with Tidal. Less we talk about Tidal, the better. Right. Uh, Less we talk about Beats, the better. But nevertheless, (laughs) the point remains that what he's basically saying is the attention has been, uh, has been, that the, the product has been given away for free in order to capture the attention. And once captured, that attention is monetized on other platforms that have some element of scarcity in them. Mm-hmm. Is that a good summation, Tom, of what this is saying? Oh, no, absolutely. And listen, we talked about this. I've been talking about this for a decade because of the Internet. I said that celebrities were going to be the new brands. 
mm-hmm. and they were gonna they were gonna understand this because these streaming spoils are going to stars. They're going to artists with a following. Right. Right. Now, whether or not you can become a star rapidly or not, that's besides the point. It, it, the other musicians aren't getting any spoils, right? It's right. the ones that have these huge followings, and then they monetize that attention, and, and that doesn't seem to be much of a problem for them. No. It's funny how that's not much of a problem. It says the indirect spoils of sc- streaming can be even greater. The weekend parlayed his play count 5.5 billion streams in the past two years into an estimated $75 million touring advance, create an excellent product, make it widely available, and flip the monetization switch when the timing is right. I know. Isn't that key how he says that? He says, give it away, create something good, give it away, Yeah, and then know when to flip the monetization switch. The weekend actually flat out says that he wouldn't have a career were it not for the Internet. Um, he says, I really wanted people who had no idea who I was to hear my project. That's kept trying to capture attention. Right. You don't do that by asking for money. Wait, there it is. There, <laughs> there it, it is. is. But see, there's some things that you can do that with. There's other things that you can't, right? So you can do mm-hmm. that with music. You get a great microphone, you record, right. you get a video camera, you put it out there for free. People love it. They start listening to it. it they spread it around. Try doing that with a movie. You know, you can't do it. And if you think you can do it with a book, that's fine. But a lot of people don't want to go to a concert to listen to an author talk, right? So right. they'll read the book for free. And then unless you can continuously pump these books out and start charging for them, then the game is over for you. Well, that's why I, my observation, I think yours too, is there's so much training online, there's so many courses, there's so much instruction, there's so many webinars, there's so many um, uh, 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 marketing funnels right. and drip campaigns and free PDFs and give me your email in exchange for. And so you get the five video series and then if you're intrigued enough, you're going to drop the $250 for the actual course. That's a, a model that's, that is really well suited to the internet, right? Oh, of course it is. That's kind of the Everybody's equivalent. hungry. They're hungry. They're starving for attention. Yeah. So they say, I'll buy this $99 course, and then I'll figure out how to get attention. Good luck. Yeah, I saw something interesting this morning. You know, I'm all these, uh, one of these uh, lists that I got is a, for screenplays, and I got this one that said, uh, use these tools to write your summer blockbuster. <laughs> and it was like five different, whatever, courses, webinars, MP3s, I don't know what they were. Uh, all aimed at helping you write your summer blockbuster for like eighty dollars, and I thought, <laughs> I know. <laughs> you know, granted, Tom, anybody can write a movie if they put their mind and heart to it, but not everybody's going to write what ends up becoming a summer blockbuster. I think that's safe to say. Everybody can <laughs> sing a song if they open their mouth. That doesn't mean anyone <laughs> wants to listen to it either, right? <laughs> oh. Rants and raves are coming up. Remember, this episode of Media Unplugged is brought to you by Stack Adapt. Stack Adapt is an omnichannel digital advertising platform that helps brands accelerate customer acquisition. Stack Adapt helps you find audiences that are reading about relevant topics or competing products before they search for them. That means you reach potential customers faster and more efficiently. Please support Media Unplugged by visiting stackadapt.com and requesting an invite today. Hey, tell them we sent you. Yes. Tom, it's time for Rants and Raves. Okay, I got one. Oh, I have a I have I'm a anxious. rant. I have a rant, and this one is about. I guess it's in keeping with attention and fake news and and all of this nonsense that the internet is spreading around. Have you heard of this couple who claim that they learned to live without eating food? No. Oh yeah, they call themselves breatharians. Okay, oh, man. Listen, Th- they say they survive on the energy of the universe. Now. In an interview, this one guy, this part of this couple, Ricardo, said that he wouldn't recommend starving the body of food without the proper training. But he insisted that with the proper tools and awareness, which the couple offers for sale, by the way, Mm -hmm. that the practice isn't harmful. Now, listen to what he told CNN. He said, we all know the air is light. We all know there is energy in nature. So there's no way this can be dangerous. Now, when he was Mm -hmm. asked to respond to critics from like the medical community and who insisted that it's not possible to survive without food and water. He said, quote, it's not possible when you don't have the state of mind. 
When your mind doesn't believe it's possible, it won't be possible. Hmm. So here comes the rant. As strange and as stupid as that sounds, let me give you one stupider. This story was picked up and published in several major news outlets over the past week. Yahoo, The Sun, The New York Post, The Independent, The Daily Mail, Metro, and a number of other media outlets. And with the couple's claims presented as unquestioned fact. Wow. So with the media hungry for stories to drive attention and clicks, and the public hungry for information to make them happier, healthier, wealthier, and better looking, I'm afraid the movie Dumb and Dumber is becoming a reality in our mediated life <laughs> online. <laughs> Forget Dumb and Dumber. The real uh, uh, benchmark movie is Idiocracy. That must be it, then. Did you ever see that? I did see it. Yeah. It's, it's, it'd be good to take another look at it today. Yeah, I think I'm going to watch it again as soon as we... <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. That don't try great. that. Don't try that, though. Don't no. like, Because you read it in the news... Don't go buy their uh, their ninety dollar training program so that you don't have to eat. Is there a ninety dollar training program? No, they have a training. They have they sell tools and and training. Are that, you serious? No, you didn't this mention is why that part. I'm, yeah, I did. This is why I'm telling you that the thing is so ridiculous. The the media gave them all this attention. Wow. Can I? I just. Forget it. I, just, I don't get it's it. It's interesting, and I guess this is, I shouldn't even mention this, but maybe I will anyway. As you know, <laughs> as a lot of people know, my wife owns a yoga studio. She's a yoga teacher. And um, the, at uh, Podcast Movement, there was a, 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 a one of the speakers uh, there last year, and I guess this year, um, has a podcast about um, yoga and wellness, that kind of stuff. And her topic last year was how to make a million dollars from your podcast. And I was struck by it because... First of all, if you go to her site and look at all her stuff, what she really does is she has training programs in mm. the real world and online. She has, you know, trips to various exotic places to do <laughs> yoga and other stuff. So she's got an empire that is based, that may be driven in part by the juice she gets from having a podcast, which doesn't have that many listeners to it. Um but she isn't making a million dollars from her podcast. She's making a million dollars because her podcast is part of a larger business model. And I think, <laughs> and you know, people's zeal to want to convert everything to a million dollars, which is, you know, well, not credit just, to Austin Powers. Yeah. It's still a nice round number. Yeah, not just uh, that. It's, we, people don't want to do the work. They don't want to make the million dollars by having this great yoga studio. They want to teach other people how to do a great yoga studio because it's a lot easier to sit in a microphone. Well, I, it's funny you say that because that's one of the things in the yoga space, you know, is most of the money is made not from actually offering classes, but from teaching people how to teach. Exactly. And there's one studio in our, uh, in our uh, part of the country that um, uh, had an awful lot of students. They pumped out 500 teachers, and then after five years, they closed. Well, I don't know where those 500 teachers are teaching, but I do know they made an awful lot of money from teaching them to teach. <laughs> that won't be your rant. We'll let you have your no, rant. No. <laughs> so I think it's about time. Uh -oh. It's been about six months, Tom. Oh, you're going to rave about something. No, not that. <laughs> you're going to talk about artisanal. Oh, no, I know what it is. I know what's coming. The Wax Museum. It's is time coming. to update news of Wax Museums. That's right, Tom. So uh, it's been six months, so I think it's entirely appropriate because, as you know, I'm just fascinated by this notion of Wax Museums and more to the point, fasc fascinated by the fascination that people who go to wax museums have with wax museums. <laughs> so this is a piece from some article from India where wax museums have evidently penetrated the consciousness, and it's called Johnny's Wax Museum. <laughs> now, I don't know whether, you know, Johnny is like a word with a lot of meaning in India, but here it's, you know, it doesn't mean that much. But it's lo located in the capital city, Shimla, in India. And here's what they say. It has 16 life-size wax statues of popular personalities, uh, which means it takes about three minutes to see them all. Are they all John, like John Wayne? <laughs> no, they are not. I don't think John Wayne's there. But they're <laughs> from various fields, such as Bollywood sports, Hollywood politician sports. The statues displayed at the historic Willow Bank Estate are made, of course, in Madame Tussauds, London, which is the oh, only place gosh. anybody knows how to make them or cares to know how to make them. But among they listed all 16 of them, and among them are Michael Jackson, because... Of you course. Can't, you, you can't, can't have, a, have wax exactly. a wax museum without having Michael Jackson. U.S. President Barack Obama. Oh. I don't have the heart to tell them. <laughs> 
<laughs> I just don't have the heart. And, of course, actor Paul Walker of Fast and the Furious. Oh, of course, I, yeah. With, I don't yeah. have the heart to tell them about that either. You can, however, get a wax replica of your hand for just 450 rupees. <laughs> I don't know why I'd want a wax replica of my hand, but evidently for 450 rupees. Now, Tom, in case you thought that was all, no, it's been a busy week for wax museums, because here's another one. U.S. President Donald Trump moved to safer location after a weekend of mischief in Dublin's Wax Museum. Oh, God. <laughs> How do you find this stuff? <laughs> Google alerts. It's very easy. By the way, that's only $7, you know, that wax hand. So I, you, I had to do, you had to do the math on that. Well, <laughs> um, So here the proprietor of the museum said, We've never had a reaction to a waxwork like Donald. We have a rope around him, but it still hasn't stopped people sticking their hands in his hair. <laughs> it's, it's made from really expensive synthetic fiber sourced from Germany, just like the real thing. And we can't have people trying to pull it out. Oh so he goes on to say, we're very much a family attraction. This kind of behavior isn't just hand gestures for selfies isn't. <laughs> As a result, Donald will be moved next week to a new location at the Waxworks where it can be monitored from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. each day on closed circuit TV. Oh. Another attraction that hardline conservative Trump might warm to, and I thought this was interesting editorialization here, is a recreation of an electric chair execution in the museum's basement. <laughs> it's in the basement. After putting uh, two euros in a slot, visitors can flick a switch to see a hooded prisoner contort in his chair, accompanied by the real-life screams of an actor. Oh, my God. <laughs> the U.S. president has been immortalized in wax and is available for all to see, in Dublin uh, Museum Manager Ed Coleman said. We even got a phone beside the switch in case <laughs> the governor calls to offer amnesty and save the prisoner. So far, the phone has never rung. Oh, God. So there you go. That's the news from Wax Museums, Tom. Okay, let's wait six more months before we do that again. <laughs> <laughs> That's Media Unplugged for this week. Please remember to subscribe to us at iTunes or on Stitcher. And by the way, if you want no more Wax Museum news, hey, we're all ears. But so far, with that, that hue and cry has not been heard. <laughs> And while you're there, please rate the show. It helps other folks discover us in case that's wise. And we don't even care if you're a bot. Do it anyway. Yeah, by the way, bots are welcome. <laughs> bots are welcome. Uh, you can also catch us at art19.com, Radio Inc., Media Village, Google Play Music, or wherever bots can be found. <laughs> you can follow Tom on Twitter at Tom Asak, or Join his bots. Yeah, absolutely. And Mark at Mark Ramsey Media. <laughs> Send us your questions and comments using hashtag Media Unplugged. If there's a media topic you want us to cover, let us know. Tweet us. Catch up on older episodes at our website, MediaUnplugged.net. You can find out what happened in Wax Museum six months ago if you check December. <laughs> Special thanks to the producer of Media Unplugged, Jeff Schmidt. Exciting audio from media. You can find him at jeff-schmidt.com, and he really is amazing. Please finally check out uh, Tom's new book, I Am Keats, the novelization. It's really terrific, and it's available at Amazon or wherever fine books can be found. For Tom Asecker, I'm Mark Ramsey. Thank you for listening. 